Hello, everybody. Thank you for registering and welcome to the panel discussion, <coughs> Contemporary Art, Talent and the Art School Curriculum, which is held in conjunction with the Exhibition Talent Show by Harry Meadley at the Exhibitions Programme Blip Blip Blip, which is at the Vinzavod Centre for Contemporary Art in Moscow. <coughs> My name is Sean Kay and I'm the Programme Leader for Foundation Art and Design at the British Higher School of Art and Design in Moscow. And prior to this, I was the Programme College of Art in the UK, where I worked for 23 years, uh, and it was there that I initially established Blip Blip Blip, and together with the artist Harry Meadley, I ran the programme from 2013 to 2019. <clears throat> Blip 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 is committed to examining and fostering relationships between art practice and art education. It sets out to connect young art students with a network uh, of artists of national and international standing, it functions both as an exhibitions program and as an educational enrichment program for art students, encouraging students to volunteer and to supplement their official course curriculum by becoming active in the program. The program aims to provide an experience of the many facets of art making through encouraging students to be proactive in their engagement with the art world. It functions as a platform for and a dialogue between art students and emerging and mid to foster at the end of 2020 blip 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 was re-established in moscow and the inaugural exhibition was to have appropriately a project by harry meadley but due to the travel restrictions this didn't happen and the first exhibition was instead a show that was titled Foundations Mass. This celebrated the centenary of the radical Moscow art school, the Kutamas, and speculated about its continued legacy within British foundation courses. <clears throat> However, Harry's exhibition Ta talent show is currently at Blip Blip Blip, and today's panel discussion has grown out of that project. The event's a webinar, which means that you'll be able to ask questions of the panel at the end by typing into the Q&A, and the event is being recorded and will later be up uploaded to the website blipblipblip.co. Magnus Quaife has kindly agreed to, to host the discussion. Magnus is an artist who is represented by Workplace Community of Artists in Gateshead. He is a founding director of Teaching Painting, a cross-institutional organization whose remit is to investigate the teaching of contemporary paint painting practices within art schools um, through conferences, exhibitions, workshops, lectures, and publications. His current research seeks to identify and to question the shared assumptions which underpin approaches to higher, edu higher ed education in fine art. He studied at Chelsea College of Art and at Manchester School of Art, where he also worked for 15 years, and he was re recently appointed Professor of Fine Art Pedagogy at UniArts Helsinki. And I'm going to, to hand over now to Magnus to introduce the panel. Thanks, Sean, and uh, thanks for the invite to uh, chair the panel discussion today on what I think is a really, uh, well, I hope, I hope everyone finds it a very interesting uh, subject. I think there's kind of different ways that we might approach it. Um, what I'll do, I'm going to introduce uh, the panellists first of all, and then we'll get started with the questions. And if, uh, as Sean says, we, we do welcome questions from the public, but if you would like to just hold back till the towards the end of that discussion, and then your questions won't get lost in a big big list of questions so hold back on on typing those uh, questions in if you could um, the first panelist I would like to introduce is Annie Davy. she's an artist researcher and teacher at UCL Institute of Education her work is centered around the sociology philosophy and fantasies of art education she's completing a PhD that examines the legacies of fine art education formed under the welfare state within the contemporary neoliberal university and the ways in which historical models of the artist haunt and mobilized and persist through pedagogy, marketing, and the educational turn in curating. The second panelist I'd like to introduce is Misha Levin, director of the Moscow School of Contemporary Art, the program leader, contemporary art course, and an artist. Misha graduated in 2007 from the Slade School of Fine Art, UCL, with a BA Honours in Fine Art and in 2009 from the Royal Drawing School with a postgraduate diploma. He started teaching at the British High School of Art and Design in 2000 and 
Uh, this is Harry Meadley. Um, he's an artist born and based in Leeds in the UK and a lecturer on the BA Fine Art course at Leeds Beckett University. Um, Meadley's practice uh, is controversial and cooperative and it takes a, a sorry it takes a cooperative approach to making art often working on location within galleries arts organizations and institutions in the development of projects that address how art operates in a social context and finally John Seth uh, John is an artist teacher and writer he describes himself as primarily a performance artist uh, he's the 4D pathway leader in fine arts at Central St. Martins, University of the Arts London. John's performance work has taken the form of collab a collaborative laboratory. This performance project was developed through workshops delivered with students and artists in different contexts over a number of years at Central St. Martins, Leeds College of Art, and with Sesc Sao Paulo in Brazil. The last, maybe final workshop culminated with the performance public manifestation at Sesc 24 de Mao, Sao Paulo in March 2018. So really, uh, I think, I hope very qualified and interesting uh, selection of panelists to, to discuss this, hopefully from a few different perspectives. I wanna start, Harry, by asking you, uh, if, if you would, to expand a little bit on how the idea of the exhibition emerged, the kind of uh, 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 problems or issues that you wanted to address through the exhibition. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, just to begin, uh, in a way, it's it's not fully my exhibition. Um, I, I sort of, I, in a way, initiated it, but really was a project that developed out of initially working with four students um, who were on on the fine art course at the the British Higher School, um, and that they formed the the talent show committee. And, and in a sense, I worked with them remotely, um, and they they helped sort of develop and, and put on this talent show within the school um, and then out of that event um, the almost the offer was that the winner of the talent show would would sort of feature within the exhibition itself in the gallery space um, and they they very wisely uh, on the night decided to award that to all of the participants uh, and so it then became a sort of larger group show which I think it, it was it was a wonderful outcome of the project um, but where it stems from and I think I mean it goes long goes further back than this maybe for me but I, I, the, the anecdote that I, I, this evening I'm choosing to tell um, is that uh, last summer I was you know a lot of us during lockdown didn't have too much to do and uh, I was converting the basement in my house um, sort of on my own with uh, you know some degree of experience you know working as a, a gallery technician at various points and things like that um, but at one point I was doing some plasterboarding, which I've never really dealt with. You know, in the art world, we, we generally use MDF boards or if we're just knocking up cheap gallery walls. Um, and plasterboard's pretty like uh, lethal or breakable stuff. And I managed to like, uh, with a st Stanley knife, really badly cut into my arm uh, and then subsequently pass out. Um, and, and, and so, you know, my wife ran downstairs and found me on the floor with blood pouring out my arm. And, uh, and, and then we got an ambulance round. Um, and, and I mean, the first thing that was reassuring was the one of the, the sort of, you know, first responder women who uh, came with the ambulance. She said, oh, her, her father actually, you know, he, he works with plasterboard his whole career and his arm is full of scars like this. So she reassured me that it wasn't my own uh, failings um, that, that caused this accident um, but anyway I, I, as the day went on and I went into hospital and I was getting patched up and the, the nurse I ended up having a you know quite an interesting conversation with uh, where you know she sort of asked me what I did and I said okay I'm an, I'm an artist and a lecturer and uh, you know work in art school and she, and she sort of said oh I, I would have loved to have gone to art school I would have really loved to to have been an artist but I'm just not talented and um, which I thought, you know, I felt really sad about. And I mean, I was very glad she was a nurse and, and was very sort of uh, indebted to, to the care being given to me. Um, but I think this is a sentiment that I've encountered multiple times in my life uh, where often people have felt 
um, yeah, that they, they almost weren't ever offered a route into whether that's art education or being an artist or, or thinking of themselves as an artist, because often very early on in their life, they were identified as maybe not having artistic talent. Um, and, you know, and I think we can expand that beyond just art, the art world route or the art educational route. I think these, these uh, prescribed um, ideas of, of what is and isn't talent in society uh, as, you know, where we often identify in young people, okay, you're, 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 you seem good at this. This is what you should do in life. Um, and yeah, I think it's just something that seems very unfortunate and also a, maybe a little bit at odds with the education that happens within the art colleges, within the universities, where often, you know, we don't sit around and, and expect students to produce very accurate drawings of, you know, jugs on tables or things like that, that you might do in high school. Um, you know, we, we talk about unlearning and we break a lot of these things apart, but there's still this, um, you know, early selection process that that stems around this notion of talent. Um, and I think equally within the art schools, talent is this maybe slightly taboo or awkward or not very talked about um, thing or, you know, and definitely as art educators, it's something that I, I, I would, you know, in a way hope we, we at least question or we break apart. And um, so really that was the, the origins or, or a bit of where this project comes from. Uh, and somehow in my, you know, uh, mind that ended up being, well, what what would a talent show in an art school look like? Uh, and that was really the question that, that drove the project forward. And, and, and through that, I suppose it seemed to parody the idea of talent. Um, and what was noticeable in one of the videos that I saw of the actual talent competition was that the students seemed to, the students who were in the audience seemed to respond respond most strongly uh to the participants in the talent show who were kind of sending it up mm -hmm. so there were um uh, you know one young man uh, got up and uh, played a wonderful song on i i, I is it a zither i don't know anyway the, the, the kind of instrument that he's playing like this and he sings his heart out for about six minutes and he got a, you know he got a good reception a round of applause and everyone seemed to appreciate it and then there were these kind of more um I suppose kind of comical uh, performances that we could identify in a perhaps a fluxus tradition or something I don't know but but one of the students kind of walking a finger up her hands and round her back and then under a leg um, uh, and then the next student gets up and she's got a pair of scissors on a on a really kind of long arms that she's made out of of some wood and cuts a sheet of A4 paper in half and these are kind of uh, there's something absurd about putting these into a talent show uh, and again that seemed to parody the idea of a talent show and they got rapturous receptions you know the students somehow really appreciated that so do you think the the students were buying into that idea of somehow parodying the the notion of talent yeah uh, and I, I think um you know if, uh, that was especially with the talent show committee themselves you know that was a big part of the conversations we had is is how do you introduce it how do you frame it and um yeah almost how are people going to respond to it um and i think you know in, in essence that question of you know what does a talent show in, in an art school look like i think lends itself instantly to thinking well okay the, the students are maybe going to sort of subvert that or critique that or question that uh, and and you know i think you know gladly they they did um but it's, it's, it's maybe also, you know, you could look at that as a, as a way of, of circumnavigating the, the issue or, or not wanting to be genuine about it. Mm. Um, you know, it's sending it up, but in a way it's, it's still, it still arguably could be seen as a bit of a diversion away from, you know, where there is still some odd reality about, not necessarily talent, but you know, the, where it's the competitiveness of the, the of, of, of establishing a career in some capacity, um, or, or succeeding within these sort of institutional contexts. Um, so, you know, I, I, in a way, it's a positive sign that the students are being encouraged to to to, to challenge and question, and subvert things, um, which you know maybe is is more of a, a talent to to appreciate. Um, 
Um, yeah, great. Thanks, Harry. And I suppose there's a question under underpinning all this, which I'll open up to uh, the rest of the panel. But when we talk about talent in the art school, what are we actually talking about? And maybe I'm going to invite John perhaps to, to see if he's got any thoughts about what, what, what do we mean when we're thinking about talent? And uh, yeah, then we'll open it up further, perhaps. John, you're on mute. The, the classic Zoom. I promise I wouldn't do that, but there we go. <laughs> um, it's it's odd when 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 Sean first uh, spoke to me about um, about this um, uh, symposium um, and mentioned what the subject was um, and whether I had any thoughts on it. And I said, well, I don't think I have any thoughts at all on the notion of talent, um, and that it was, in a sense, something to be avoided in some way um, and, and I, I quite I quite like that it's that the proposition for this discussion uh, is making me think about it and it's made me think about it to the extent that I'm not really any longer sure what the hell I think about it now um, having thought that it was not something to bother with um, I'm still sure that it's not something to bother with but I'm not sure I know why it is something to not bother with. Um, so I'm, I'm very intrigued by, by the responses actually, um, Harry, that you kind of describe in relation to the exhibition uh, and how to some extent it underlies, underlines precisely that uh, skepticism uh, around the notion of talent. Um, that even when you try and sort of say, well, let's look at this seriously, you know, without, without any irony, just let's look at this. Uh, and what you get in response is actually exactly what you'd expect um, from the context of, of an art school. Um, and so maybe the notion of talent has moved away from art and maybe that's good, uh, that has gone somewhere else. Um, and maybe we shouldn't worry too much that it has gone somewhere else. Weirdly, I never thought I was going to say this, what I'm just now saying, um, that actually this is really good. This, this notion of talent has left the domain of art and gone away uh, from art altogether, uh, abandoned art. You know, um, and saying, and it's saying to us, like, you know, we do not need to think about art in relation to talent. We can think about it in relation to lots of different kinds of practices in life. Um, and Magnus, in the way in which you were describing some of the performances uh, uh, in in the show, that were, in a sense, like kind of demonstrations of talent. You know, mm -hmm. um, but not necessarily. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's meant to be ironic. Um, those demonstrations of talent, um, but in other contexts, it's it's not at all meant to be ironic. When somebody demonstrates that they can, um, I don't know, um, um, they're really good at gardening as a talent, which I am not, um, and um, and that that in a sense then becomes uh, a notion of talent that sits within a completely different domain, and maybe talent sits in lots of different domains really, and you know, and we ought not to worry about it at all. Um, having said that, uh, I'm, still, I'm still bothered a bit by this idea of how talent is thought about as a, almost like a kind of genetic predisposition. Because uh, I remember when I had said to my mother that I was thinking of, of, uh, of studying art, um, she was kind of like bewildered and surprised. You know, well, there's no one in the family that, you know, it has an artistic, you know, whatever, bone in their body. <laughs> um, you know, like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> like, um, and, and the other, I mean, the other possibility was studying music, which, you know, um, received tremendous amount of derision. Um, and so that was the end of that. So I ended up doing art. Um, so, so the sense in which it's somehow like its position that somehow we innately have, um, is not something that I I, um, I even understand actually, except 
that we do notice that you know somebody has a predisposition to be able to do something more easily than somebody else you know um, and in a sense i think i think you're kind of identifying this harry uh, this particular uh, idea or this particular kind of observation in a sense of thinking that um here, here are here are sets of talents that people seem to bring with them that they're able to do these things. And yet within the art school context, we don't recognize it in that way. Um, except that in another way, we probably do. We just don't talk about it. Yeah, maybe that's, that's, maybe that's all for now, I think. No, thanks, John. I think there's something in it about, in, in what you're saying about it being innate, which it, it relates to um, uh, an essay by Thierry de Derve, which um, I, I think was first published in the mid 1990s and he talks about um the, the kind of romantic academicized notion of of talent uh being o overtaken in uh modernist the modernist art school by the by a universal notion of creativity so it's still innate creativity but it's universal but annie i could see that you were you were nodding when john was talking about perhaps that we we don't really need to think or we don't think about talent in the art school is that do you want to Add something from your perspective on the idea of how we how we view talent within the art school or don't yeah okay um right so similarly to john this is you know been sort of puzzling me today and yesterday thinking about it and i would come at it from sort of two angles i feel it's quite hard to get to the point of talking about what this talent was and is and what it might what might constitute it without first of all thinking about the sort of more social construction of the idea of talent so i would see talent as um a sort of discourse that's been that gets mobilized and has been mobilized at different moments in time and different places to sort of different ends Ultimately, whilst I do think it's an interesting problem to think about within an art school context, I think it's been kind of bled dry um, through the 2000, sort of new labour in, in the UK context. Um, talent was a word that was used a lot in a kind of, um, in relation to an idea of meritocracy through new labour in the late 1990s and early 2000, and how that's very bound up with the sort of creative industries and yeah. the the idea of promoting the creative industries and gifted um, and talented in schools schemes like that were when you yeah, labor schemes weren't they definitely so, yeah gifted and talented within the school context was something that's kind of gone out of fashion but very much about um promoting the idea that uh talent plus effort equals um a kind of meritocracy eventually equals some kind of equality so Yes, in terms of this sort of social dimension, I think an important point is the ways in which it's a slippery term that um, operates in different ways within a fine art context in relation to the place that the fine art students come from, and that's the school or the family context, as, as John was saying, but also in relation to the field of art practice, which I think a uh, fine art course promises to lead the students to. I think anyone that's been to an art fair or something like that will have overheard many conversations um, by the, the people who are perhaps at the higher end of the, the art world, buying the work, collecting, that kind of thing. Terms like talent and genius are still very rife. They're still very much upheld, I think, within um, aspects of the art world. And whilst it's been sort of deconstructed within the art school context, I think it's something that um, problematically still upholds a system. It's a system that we might want to think about um, not necessarily training students or promising that that's the only destination that they can kind of head towards. Um, and I was also thinking about the idea of the school context and how talent, whilst these gifted and talented schemes that were promised to sort of promote students who um, came from disadvantaged backgrounds and stuff like that actually very much often did um, advantage the already advantaged. So I sort of picked up on the word that John said of, of recognition. And I think one of the problems with talent is the ways in which it can misrecognize a sort of social advantage for talent. 
So that's the kind of sociological, part of the sociological take on talent. I think there's still room to kind of problematize what it might be. Are we talking about certain capacities? If Thierry de Duve was talking about skills based on tradition back in the 19th century, mm -hmm. um, you know, we could speculate that perhaps a desire, a pull, kind of obsessive qualities, um, perversions, they are kind of things that um, lead to somebody producing and getting really involved in making work and something that could be recognized as talent. Equally, I think we could look at um, awareness of a field and a kind of more intellectual sort of dimension. But ultimately, I think, um, I'm not sure how worthwhile that is. In the, I'm not sure how useful a term it is within the art school now. Maybe I'll leave it there for now. Okay. Okay. I think it kind of the, yeah. There's lots of questions emerging around around these ideas. And Misha, I wonder if there's um, if if you're kind of listening to this, and obviously you you did your undergraduate and postgraduate course in the UK, but you work in uh, uh, Moscow now. But the um, uh, Moscow School of Contemporary Art and the British Higher School of Art and Design um, seem to have uh, quite a progressive idea about arts education, um, but in in the broader context in, in 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 Russia, do you feel that talent is something that maybe is still thought about it within the art school context? Um, definitely, this is something that's still uh, kind of uh, in a great tradition that uh, usually uh, you know students undertake. In, in generally in schools and universities undertake exams where they again practice their academic skills in order to be admitted so basically and uh, that that means that they need to show uh, that ability to to uh, kind of uh, have uh, a level of skill and level of uh, engagement and a level of uh, certain kind of standards that expect from them. And for some strange reason, it, it is being called talent. Yet uh, the reason why I kind of looked for a different place to be educated was that uh, back uh, in the middle of 90s, when I tried to be admitted to the art school, uh, uh, I brought uh, the works that I was doing on my own. And basically the uh, admission committee, they looked at it and said, well, we don't do this kind of things here. So uh, this kind of, you know, more of a kind of a personal way approach to practicing art was not something that was considered. So basically something that on one hand we would consider to be, you know, a personal talent in certain creative field when you express your own kind of vision or inner kind of abilities to use a technique or use certain mediums and stuff. Uh, on a certain level, it perceived as something uh, awkward or not being in a, in a kind of a position when you're able to achieve a level and being called a real perspective talent so and uh, for that reason I I, I, I I kind of escaped and went on somewhere where you know nobody told me that I have to do things in a certain way where I could have figured out the way I want things and just being maybe advised rather than being told but uh, uh, I had an interesting conversation a few weeks ago with uh, with quite well known kind of expert in the new media art here in Russia. He's actually Italian and he educated in London and UCL and then uh, went on to live in Russia for the past 20 years. And uh, uh, we were talking about, uh, we had an open kind of discussion lecture and we were talking about what kind of uh, young artists need to have in their kind of uh, portfolio to be successful. And he used the word talent several times. And I couldn't help myself not to ask him question, what do you define by talent? 
And he said, well, it's, a, it's difficult to, you know, give a certain description of the word, but it's certainly a number of things that uh, involves, you know, knowing the context within the, you know, in which uh, a young perspective artist is working, cleverness, uh, certain level of, uh, I don't know, uh, ambition. So for him, it's a kind of a very uh, a comfortable word to describe this kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, a personality that really has a chance to foster and to be successful in whatever field uh, he or she is working. So uh, yet I, I kind of thought in my almost 10 years teaching practice, whether I use that word to in communication with any student and saying, well, you're a real talent or you've done this very talented or, or in any conversation. And I, I, I kind of realized that I, even if I want to, I kind of almost stop myself. So it almost feels like it's a forbidden word that actually uh, doesn't, doesn't explain anything. It doesn't give any kind of a contextual reference to what, what it means to a person that I would say this. So uh, I, I personally have a really mixed feeling about, you know, if, if we do consider a talent within the, you know, educational system, to what degree and when do we refer to talent? Whether when we yeah. give good marks or when we see somebody produced an excellent piece of work or whether they've been, you know, working very hard and been uh, developing successfully through their studies. Uh, or, so, so for me, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a uh, difficult area where I personally don't feel comfortable. Yeah. I think there's something really interesting there, Misha, in the idea that um, perhaps we, we can still recognize talent when we see it, but we don't necessarily talk about it. Personally, I, I, I've moved a little bit away from that in the past few years of my teaching. Maybe not to tell a student that they're talented, but, but I suppose when uh, in the mid-90s when I was at art school, that nobody would say anything was even good. You know, there was just a conversation about the art and you that's something you kind of had to get used to, right? We're going to talk about the work. And I suppose that's maybe this, um, I think, was it John Cage who said that, um, uh, you know, value judgments stop us talking about the, the, the actual thing. And I think that's a valid position. But there's also, I think, um, well, in, in the UK, at least with the massification of um, uh, uh, students coming in who to me seem increasingly deeply uncertain about uh, uh, being there um, and sometimes just to tell them what they've done is really good and really interesting you can see them grow a little bit from and and, and why they would value me saying that I don't know but of course that I'm being slightly facetious there because I understand the, the student tutor relationship but I think there, there can be something helpful so that I think there's maybe that's something we can go on to to talk about a little bit further, recognizing the talents in students and whether there's any worth in worth in that as well. But also I wanted to to go back a little bit, Misha, because I thought it was really interesting. You, you, you mentioned your, your own interview and then talking to a, a, a colleague about looking for talent in the the interviewing or the admissions process. And as, so the question to, to, to all of you, if, if um, talent isn't really something that's valuable to think about in the process of art school education why do we have admission systems what what is the value what's the point in an admission what are we looking for if it's mm. if it's not some degree maybe maybe i'm conflating the idea of aptitude with talent here but why do we do it and john perhaps I, I, maybe i'm wrong but i did hear that um csm were were moving away from interviewing entirely that's not the case. Okay. No, no, so, not at all. Um, someone told me a fib there. <laughs> 
Um, I think we moved away from interviewing students who are progressing from the foundation to the BA okay. uh, within, the, within the college or the colleges. Uh, but I think that also might only be something that's happening this particular year because of the difficulties of organizing face-to-face -face interviews. Mm -hmm. um, but having just come out of uh, doing interviews online, um, I can assure you we're doing interviews. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I do love the way in which uh, wonderful uh, bits of uh, myth-making seem to circulate around uh, CSM. <laughs> I'll try and remember who, who, who told me that and let you know. <laughs> but it's true that it's, it's happened in relation to the foundation course. Yeah. Um, um, I, 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 like, I like this question you posed, though, Magnus, about, you know, what, what is it that we're interviewing for, um, if not looking for something like aptitude, which, you know, is a, another word for talent, perhaps. Um, but... Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure that is what we're looking for. Um, it's it's so it's Harry. I have to thank you for for you know kind of forcing us to confront this this question because uh, I I honestly I'm so perplexed by it in in, in different ways because on the one hand I, I want to kind of follow a, another way of thinking about this which is to to take the word and give it another signification altogether um and and maybe by doing that we come closer to seeing what it could be doing you know rather than what it identifies um because i think we, we run into trouble when we're wanting words to to function as identifiers in a way yeah? Um, instead of wanting or seeing words as as functioning in some way, and I think I'm, you know, I'm, you know, sort of echoing a little bit of what what Annie was saying, um, you know, so to to think about, you know, what is it that the word does, or in what way does it function? Um, I'm sorry to sound a little bit kind of Foucauldian about this, um, but I, I think it's probably appropriate that we should be. And but you know and you know and in, in in the spirit of that to also you know ask the ask the question that he poses so when Foucault poses this question around you know the identity or the idea of authorship in that still I think you know one of his very beautiful essays um, and at the end you know he, he says something like you know um, and after all this. So after he considers all of these questions, all of the kind of discursive formations around the notion of authorship, he ends with, uh, with something like, um, you know, yet I can hear somebody whispering, what matters who's speaking? Um, which is, you know, a, a line from, from Beckett. Um, and, it, and, it just, and it just in that moment suddenly makes you think, oh, hang on a second, maybe I haven't understood this essay at all. <laughs> like it suddenly becomes something else in that moment because he forces us to suddenly flip our thinking to ask that question, what matters who's speaking? What matters in terms of what we consider to be talent or non-talent? Um, and in that moment, we start to have to think about the term differently and maybe think about what it may be doing differently. Um, and it was in that light, I think, um, the, the you know the essay that I uh, that I circulated um, uh, a couple of days ago by um, um, by Delaney Samuel Delaney um, which because you know up to that point I was just thinking well you know this is going to be a quick conversation <laughs> uh, and then I, and then having read Delaney's essay um, I was thinking oh oh. So, and you know, I'm just going to quote from Delaney here. My feeling is that literally, so he's talking about in relation to teaching of, of, for writers, uh, for novelists. My feeling is that literary talent is definitely not something that involves mastery in any way, shape or form. You know, and my head just exploded. I just thought, that, then what is it? <laughs> and, you know, and what he then starts to suggest, which is, you know, so interesting, I think, like this somehow, this is something in the body, you know, like it's something that 
it inhabits or, or we embody in some way. Um, but without, you know, without it being, um, uh, uh, in a sense, a kind of representational model, without it being something that provides us with a definition. So in other words, I think when, when he thinks about it in this way, when he talks about it as this sort of bodily force, um, you know, like um, an urge in the fingers to shape language in one particular way and not another, um, you know, we may be, you know, and, and you may feel like, you know, it's slipping back into, the, you know, these things that we somehow can't name. Um, and so the word talent then functions for us in that space, the thing that we can't quite name. And so we utilize a word like talent to name it, knowing all the time that this somehow is an Id inadequate name um, and so we end up discursively speculating around it. And so we, we you know, we dance in relation to it, yeah? Um, and in that sense, you know, perhaps we never arrive at a definition. We never arrive at the, you know, the, the concluding moment of it. And we never arrive at judgment, I think, actually. Um, because I think to some degree, you know, you know, going back to, sorry, I, I hope I'm not sounding like I'm flipping all over the place, but um, going back to the point that you were making, Magnus, about this idea of, of a judgment that we apply in relation to talent, yeah, at the interview, in the tutorial, for example, um, and that we suspend it to some degree. And we do, I think you're right, we do suspend judgment. Um, and I think necessarily so, because we want something to take place. Yeah? So we want to create the space in which something is enacted without judgment. You know? And then at the same time, I hear another voice whispering in my ear, but we know judgment is happening. Mm -hmm. yeah? um, and, and so we're caught within this, you know, this really weird kind of series of pincer movements that's trying to push us into certain kind of corners. And I have to say that I think that if, if the, actually it's always been there, but you know, if the mechanisms of judgment, which take the form of all of those assessment procedures and um, all of those mechanisms that we are meant to apply uh, to, um, to students' work, you know, this is where judgment keeps returning. Yeah. So every time we think that we're getting away from it, we keep entrenching it in different ways. And we can't escape that at the moment. You know, every time we think that we might escape it, we know that we can't. Yeah. So we end up dancing. So we dance in relation to all of these mechanisms of control, all of these mechanisms of, of judgment to some degree. Um, and talent then could function in a different way here where we ultimately apply it to the thing that's fundamentally unnameable. And that allows us to, to return to the space of, of a suspending of judgment. Thanks, John. Yeah, Harry, I, I want to bring you back in there because there's been quite a lot discussed about the, the, the idea that you brought to us. And maybe just to think, um, uh, bringing that on from from uh, John's debate there about, about the, the notion of it being this perhaps unnameable thing. Uh, maybe thinking about your own teaching and being at, uh, uh, at Leeds Beckett and those moments perhaps where um, uh, you, you're wandering around the studios you know, probably any time, if it's anything like the art schools I've taught in, any time before 11 in the morning when there's no students in, when that student hasn't turned up for a tutorial, and you're looking at, at, at the work kind of with nobody else, uh, else around. Those moments where you encounter something that surprises you or takes your breath away, whether it's a kind of a little installation that a student's made or a painting or a video, whatever it would be, what's, how, how do you then, because I, I think what you were talking about initially was an idea that talent can exclude mm. it, on, on the moment of getting into the art school. So that, that, that idea we were talking about with interviewing, I suppose, but once the students are in the art school um, 
and you start to recognize that students have particular facilities or aptitudes or passions about the things that they're they're doing how do you then address that is talent does talent remain problematic once a student is within the institution i suppose is the question that i'm asking yeah i mean it was funny just um just to go slightly back to the earlier question about you know what what you do in the interview process um and i absolutely hate slash have no interest in looking at students portfolios i almost have next to no interest in you know how well made their work is or anything you know i think it's inter it's interesting sometimes um but more often than not is is that it's there to to um instigate a conversation with the applicant right and and it's through that conversation that i think you you attempt to get a sense of the individual um but i mean ultimately i'm i'm always keen to just give everyone and anyone who sort of wants to pursue art i'm i'm always in favor of so i'm not particularly um you know that scrupulous when it comes to interview procedures um but i i do i think it is a tricky one, isn't it? Because I, I think, you know, um, you mentioned earlier, it's that thing sometimes that, okay, you don't see it when it's in front of you. Or, or yeah, like those moments in seminars or crits or, or tutorials or whatever, right? Where all of a sudden you get a sense that, okay, this uh, student has, has made a big step forward, right? Whether that's in their progression, whether in that's their open-mindedness, whether that's in their understanding or, you know, whatever it is like. And I think you, you do witness uh, individuals who, for whatever reason, um, are, are able to do that more frequently, let's say, um, or, or more, uh, um, yeah, or, or, or those steps are, are bigger. They, they, they progress faster. They learn faster. They, they, you know, and, and exactly what that is and how that works is, is, you know, probably too complicated to really go into at, at this stage. Um, but in terms of how you address it or how you deal with it, um, often what I, I feel that you're doing educationally within, a, within the studio or, or the group, group of students together um, is that you're, at least from my perspective, you're wanting that to, to be a positive influence on the other students around them. You're wanting those lessons that certain students are learning or steps they're making to then be evident or visible to the other students so they, they almost do it as well or they, they see that, that taking place. Um, so kind of tacit in, learning in the studio between, between peers, peer-to-peer -peer learning. Yeah, or not necessarily peer-to-peer -peer learning, but I think um, at least from from often my thinking is that there's um, there's all within a cohort. There's sometimes maybe a battle, not for the middle ground, but it's in in a way. I think sometimes you can have individual students. Not 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 say that there's only ever one, but I mean certain personalities within a cohort who can have a real positive influence on say the ambitions or the um, engagement that many other students might have. But equally you have the opposite of that. I think sometimes you can have relatively say disruptive or negatively in influencing individuals that can, can sway others. Um, and I think sometimes it's, it's how you either encourage and, and evidence that or, or if it's the opposite to some degree, how you attempt to, to mitigate it as a, as a tutor sometimes. Because um, I think, you know, the way that students influence one another is often more significant than necessarily what we as tutors might want to think of ourselves as influencing uh, them. Um, so, so for me, I think where I might think about notions of and, uh, talent or aptitude or, or whatever it is, is maybe more in students' abilities to, to have a positive impact on on their peers and ultimately that benefits them as well right like we all know that when you definitely get a, a group of students within a particular cohort who get really proactive and, and and really start advancing it brings more and more students around them in, into that mix and they they all sort of really start benefiting and you see them having you know more and more conversations and doing things and, and whatever so there's a bit of a of an expansion that happens 
Um, and I, you know, I guess where where possible, you're looking for chances to to help slightly, um, you know, encourage or facilitate or or allow that that space in which those things can happen. Um, but it is it is difficult. Uh, and I just I, I wanted to um, just pick up on on something you mentioned, Annie, when you talked about the gifted and talented initiative in the late '90s and early 2000s. And I just had this like shock of dread in my body because I remember being in high school, and the, you know, and I, I was in a Leeds comprehensive school that was, and maybe now I won't get too into the depths of the fact that it's actually a very sort of racially discriminating structure, which comes out of even the gifted and talented names came that comes out of a failed program in the 60s in New York and mm -hmm. um, that did did that exact same thing but um, like I remember being told that I was a student that was being put in the gifted and talented group and absolutely hating it and re like in, inherently rejecting it mm -hmm. or like knowing that there's something wrong about this there's something wrong in going within this high school of you know two and a half thousand students you're going to go here's a here's a bunch who we're going to say are gifted and talented and give them you know more opportunities give them funding for you know to go and visit places um, and of course it was way uh, misrepresentational racially and gender it, at, you know within the school so it, it was it was wrong on, on all accounts and I think um, you know, our uncertainty, our own ease with, with these ideas of talent, whether that's in, a, in an educational context or even in a societal context, um, you know, it, it's, there's something, there is something bad about it, uh, which is, you know, maybe more to the larger issue. Um, but I'm, I'm just very, uh, yeah, very, uh, touch to, to hear all and have all your input into this conversation it's really uh really amazing um but uh yeah that that oh as soon as that gifted and talented it was like a bad bad mm. bad nightmare or something i don't know there was um something called the warwick commission that was actually quite recently 2015 so nicholas sarota used to be head of Tate and a few other people put it together and it's another one of these many reports it's a bit about growth of booming creative economies and stuff like that but that mentions that uses the word talent something like 70 80 times but at no point apparently within the document it does it open out what that means at all so it's something that you know it kind of it it, it sort of limps on as a term and I think this is, yeah, this is interesting, this thing that you brought up, John, about um, what is it to try and repurpose a word or reinvest it with something? Because I agree, I tend to think of it as a sort of like this discourse and a discourse being something that um, is, a discourse is a accumulation of say statements or ways of talking about things that comes to shape meaning that comes to shape the thing in itself and so discourses get mobilized to sort of communicate certain things but I just wanted to just point out one last thing about this sort of relationship between the school and um, HE and that's um, that we in a moment of massively widening participation fine art courses are getting bigger they're still getting bigger. When fees came in in this country, people thought that would really affect fine art courses and it hasn't significantly. And I think it's well worth thinking about um, opening up more lines of communication between what happens prior to going to university or how ideas like talent are exist and how they, um, how those words and terms are understood. So John's example earlier of like his own history in terms of how he got into art. It's something that I think a lot of tutors could do thinking about as well as a question that could be posed to students when they begin a fine art course. And it's something that you do if you do a teacher training course. One of the first things would be to write a ref critically reflective essay on your own educational experiences. And it's pretty enlightening in terms of, you know, seeing how they kind of form a lot of our ideas in terms of what we do now. Yeah. Just, just to come back to your point there, Annie, um, um, it's it's very it's very interesting this kind of this idea of like how we think about this relationship between the art school and the school and indeed foundation courses. 
um, and you know students invariably kind of comment on the degree to which each each step in this in this progress, if you like, has always been um, indicated as an unlearning of everything that happened before. So they get onto a foundation course and everything they learned on A-level seems to be pointless. They get onto a BA course, everything they learned on the foundation course seems to be pointless. Um, and I did for a long time think, you know, well, we really ought to do something about this, you know, because it is true that that's what happens. It seems like you know every step of this seems to be about an unlearning of everything that you learned before. More recently, I started to think that maybe that is how it should be, or rather, that just is. Um, and you know, there's a there's a bit of a kind of stoic in me. It's like you know, there's nothing we can do to change this. Mm. It just seems to be so, um, in like almost like DNA enshrined in how we think about education that if we were to try and think about it in any other way, we would radically change the entire education system altogether. That it wouldn't be, you know, as uh, one, sorry, I just noticed a, a question or a comment. It wouldn't be, uh, the education wouldn't be, as I think maybe you're indicating here, uh, this killing of your soul, um, which I think largely education is. Yeah, it kills your soul, however we want to define soul. Um, and that's my experience anyway, you know, and, and in a sense, ending up doing art was like a, an accident, totally an accident. Um, I, cannot, I cannot describe to the extent to which it was a total accident. Um, and so, so, so that part of me thinks, well, you know, we can't see, seemingly can't change this. So let's say it is what it is. And that each step of this allows one the facility to unlearn what you learned. Oh. That, you know, to, yeah, sorry, go on. Well, the, one problem I'd have with that, um, I like the yeah. idea of it, but the problem I'd have is that um, it, is, it kind of assumes that we're all kind of learning at the same sort of the same stuff, yeah, at same no. points. And actually, the, the yeah. hell of a lot of learning that happens outside of education and experience happens out side of education yeah. so one thing we have got we have got this reality right now of massive universities and fine art courses in massive universities and that's the kind of that's the weird reality I think we've got to kind of think about in terms of um what it is what it is we do and I, I don't mind the idea of radically changing it all but I don't I mean I would that would be that would that be the ultimately what one one should aim for mm -hmm. in, in a way but it seems unlikely that we would ever get to this mm -hmm. un, unless some other more fundamental revolution kind of takes place um, but I, I, I agree with you completely I think that you know there's a complete sort of um, weird uh, sense of how we think about the staging of advancement mm -hmm. you know that this happened and even like you know when we think about assessments you know, why on earth should we be doing an assessment at the end of the first term of a, of a degree course? Or the end, you know, like what, what would be the point of this? You know, it's like, you know, so on, on this particular day, you've achieved this. The next week, you may not have achieved it. You know, you may suddenly unravel. And if your assessment happened to fall at that point, would that be dreadful? Of course it would be. You know, so this kind of weird sense in which we think of staging of development in this way is so absurd. I did think that, and I heard that there were like a few, sorry, we seem to be going off topic a little bit. I, <laughs> I did think that um, the pandemic seemed to open up the possibility. And there was one conversation that I heard on the radio where somebody, some education has kind of said, well, maybe it's time we reevaluated education rather than thinking about, you know, what it is that children are losing by not being at school. And therefore, when they return, they have to catch up. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, you know, it's then been, you know, the steamroller of catching up has caught up. Yeah. I, I want to bring uh, Misha back in because I think a lot, quite a few of the things that we've been discussing um, have maybe had a kind of real focus on a, a UK perspective. So certainly yes. ideas about, um, you know, fine art courses within massive universities. Um, and I, I'm not saying that's the UK alone. Of course, we have that in Australia and America and Canada and uh, other parts of Europe too. But certainly in uh, the institutions that, that Misha and I 
work in. We are, I'm, I'm part of an arts university, which is uh, 3,000 uh, students across three academies, but in the Fine Art Academy, only about 275 students across all levels uh, uh, of education. I think the Moscow School of Contemporary Art is similar in, in, in scale in terms of the students. So perhaps there's something that, that, that we do, uh, Misha, which is maybe, I don't know if, if your experience is the same, but, but is maybe more exclusive than UK arts education now. So, so I would argue that if you really wanted to do a degree in fine art in the UK, you could do it, you know, and, and the, actually some of the places that, that aren't immediately considered, um, and I would point to, for example, St. Helens College has a degree in painting, right? And I was the external examiner there and the students work is phenomenal. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll say it, by the end of their third year, they're all very talented painters. Uh, or, you know, surprisingly, when you see them come in on, first, they're non-selective, they come in on first year, they come out the other side and so so people if they're willing to consider places like that they can do a degree in fine art it is possible but maybe in maybe in russia that's not the case certainly in finland i don't think it's the case and and so there's something more exclusive so there is a kind of moment of decision about uh which students are allowed into that system and and and, and which aren't and i was wondering if um uh you uh, compared against your experience in the UK, where you did go to a very selective art school, of course. But if, there, if there's kind of a, a different relationship to the idea of talent and who gets into the art school in Russia and who would think about going to the art school even because of that? Well, the thing is, uh, uh, we, we don't really have that many art schools still that practicing fine art in a kind of a global perspective. So we still have a uh, majority of the state universities and famous art schools are very much uh, practicing a very kind of old school Soviet system of educating. And in order to get there, again, you have to be very skilled. You have to undertake the, you know, uh, several years of uh, being in the school, special art school to be trained to go to the university. And uh, yet, uh, most of the students that finish these uh, academies and, and universities, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to then, uh, you know, use that immense kind of skill base because basically they weren't able to uh, develop their own kind of thinking language uh, position and so on. The only thing that, that they've been doing is just, you know, practicing and training and do you think that then... skill base but yet yeah. in terms of their personality they 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 kind of uh, feel very lost because they don't know what to do is that then a separation you know earlier on we were talking a little bit about talent in relation to an idea of skill and saying that that was how it was framed in in de Derve's essay mm -hmm. about the the, the the european academies pre-modernism but actually what you're suggesting now is that an academy that focuses uh, almost entirely on skill does not lead to a talented artist no well i mean maybe th there are some talented artists in the end that that are able to kind of fight against the, the, this whole kind of mass of of uh, kind of just training but uh overall i think it's it's a problem and, and we are in a position where we, we, we don't look at the skill. So we don't, we don't really kind of pressure the students to develop the skill. Uh, we, we, we try to kind of establish on a, a conversation. Yet, I still think that uh, we do have certain amount of students that have that kind of a set of... Uh, of um, certain things that they, they have, like, I don't know, a good taste that just happened to have, yeah? Uh, I don't know, a, a, a good understanding of material qualities or, or, uh, or a student that been, you know, reading a lot and have a kind of a, just a wide range of, of general knowledge or a wide range of interest. And, uh, and uh, they have this, uh, I don't know, eagerness to, to kind of learn new and try new and other things. And they're certainly more, I'm gonna say talented 
Yeah, so they're certainly more able to what Harry was saying to to be the leaders, to be kind of uh, uh, like producing and 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 developing faster and and better. And and then I mean, you look at them, and you can actually say it right from the interview, without even maybe mm -hmm. seeing their work that you know, they have that kind of a base. You don't know whether, you know, education will help them, but you hope that this is this set that they obtain, whether it's genetic or whether it's down to the way that they've been, their, their family background or, or some other cosmic power, whatever, that uh, they, 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 they have a kind of a good start. Yeah, Annie, you had your hand up, so I'm going to I'm going to come back to Annie, and then um, I'll open it up to questions. There's everyone should have a, a Q and A button at the bottom of their Zoom, so if people want to use that, please, uh, for the questions, uh, I'll I'll read them out to the panelists, so you guys don't need to uh, to worry about them. But yeah, Annie, you you wanted to come back to yeah, to this is a very quick. I mean, I appreciate what you just said, Misha, because I think it does reflect actually very much the UK system this thing of recognition of the student and it's something that um, is not many people sort of speak openly about it but I think this thing of recognizing the good student on the first day of college is um, so it's quite a problem because I think there is a lot of stuff like taste that that this is based upon and the, the ways in which and it's it's a problem it's an issue in teaching across all levels of, of teaching the extent to which the teacher recognizes their own image in a student, in the ideal student, they recognize themselves sort of thing. And this sort of really perpetuates and leads to the confirmation, I would say, of a sort of system of art, which is not necessarily the only system of art there could be, or a field of art, a field of artistic practice. And we could be maybe thinking less about education as serving that field and more about however utopian it may seem, but the possibility um, of education to sort of reshape it or um, intervene somehow with it. But I'm, I appreciate your honesty because I think you're actually speaking something that um, is very familiar to me through conversations I have and stuff like that with people in the UK. And I do speak from, I would say, a privileged position because I'm not teaching in a fine art course anymore. <laughs> I think there's so many complexities at a fine art course. I'm glad to be away from that now. <laughs> I, I don't think that's a privilege not teaching on a fine art course, Annie. I think that's right. Right now, it feels not to be dealing with assessment. I'm very, no. very glad not to. I deal with assessment on an art and education course that's very, very different. Mm. Anyway, that's another thing. But... It is, and I think there's so many ways that we could come back into this. The ideas that have that have been introduced by all of you, which are absolutely fascinating. That I kind of feel um, uh, we've almost not had enough time. Well, we certainly not had enough time because it seems to open up so many other ideas it seems to to connect to so many points of how we think about what the work that's being made and uh and, and how we teach indeed that i think we could probably go on for, for for much longer but we've been talking for an hour and 10 minutes so i i'd encourage people again to put some questions in but if 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 they're not going to come uh straight away then I wonder if any of the, the panellists have a question for each other or if indeed Sean wants to rejoin us and has any questions for the panellists as well. Where's your question? Here's Sean. Hi, Magnus. Hi. Um, we've, we got on to, I thought, I thought Annie's last point was, was really, really interesting in, in, you know, in relation to... Um, the tutors sort of seeing a mirror image of, of, of themselves in, 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 in what, what they see as being talented. And, and, and again, I, I'm, I'm always quite interested in, in the sort of the, the one way students learn sometimes is, is, to, is, to re, is to rebel against the system as well, that they, that they learn through sometimes um, challenge, challenging um, norm or, or challenging the, 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 the sort of values of the of the the tutor and the institution, and I, I, th I think that's a sort of very v valuable um, model that sometimes we don't talk about enough. 
Mm. But, but then Annie sort of came on the finished about by talking about assessment in fine art courses uh, and things. And I, I, I wonder what the what the panel's um, view would be about because uh, John touched on this uh, as well about about points of assessment and what would happen if you assess that group a week later. Would all the students get the same thing because somebody might peak at a certain time? And I, I, I sort of wondered what the panel's um, um, opinion was on assessment at all. I mean, is anybody for, for getting rid of assessment altogether? I mean, would, would, would it be a better system if we didn't have it? Um, <laughs> for practice, pass and fail, I'd be fine about. <laughs> for practice for writing, mm, I, know, I know practice can be writing, but... <laughs> But there, there's there's something to be said for people's, you know. We, I guess we, we, a lot of this conversation, uh, quite rightly, is, is focused on on you know because I guess we're all in some capacity or well, are are educators and educators, um, viewing it from that position. But from a from a learner's perspective, I do think there is a desire to to be. Um, identified as, as not, maybe not talented but identified as uh, you know in a way superior to their peers mm. um, you know I think oh. often people want that they, they're not just the validation of, a, of an institution or whatever but you know they, they want it it's almost like they want to come in first place right they want oh, to, oh, that it's, to, it may to, be a little bit more simple than that I mean straightforward than that Harry and so much as that the institution institutes modes of assessment mm. And so there is an assessment that's there embedded in the institution. And to not assess is therefore to not tell the student how they are doing. Mm -hmm. So that's where it becomes the problem in a sense that, um, you know, that they're, what they're saying is that, well, uh, how am I doing? You know, at some point you're going to assess me. And I, at no point am I going to know until you assess me how I'm doing. And so that kind of sense mm -hmm. of how the institution makes this the problem so, you know, if we got rid of the classification to start with and say, OK, when you complete this course, you will leave with a degree. Um, and if you don't attend at all, you won't. <laughs> you know, maybe it's kind of uh, as, as simple as that. You know, oh God, I say it as simple as that. Really, it's not going to be as, as simple. Yeah. Um, so so I'm not sure that it's 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 as something, you know, something like um, I want to be the best necessarily. It, it could also be that, yeah. But I think it's a lot to do with the fact that the system of education that we have is already so pre predicated mm. on being evaluated. Mm. Um, that so you, you have know, to why, fulfill. You have to fulfill yeah. the obligation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at what point would you say suddenly you're going to be assessed? You know, you can't. You know, it's just you know. So, um, so yes, I think the system produces the problem. Yeah, well, I, I'd, I'd agree with that, John. I mean, I remember um, being at art school again in the, in the mid-90s. And um, yeah, I got a grade when I graduated, but I didn't see a mark from the day I arrived until that point. So I went into assessments. Um, there was no written feedback. There were no marks um, other than for essays. Annie, we did get marks for, for essays, and I shall not mention how I did on those. Uh, but yeah, so there was no marks. But then my more recent experience was working um, at York St. John University a few years ago, where their first year is pass fail. But the students wanted a mark. And it's very, I think you're right, John. I think it's that culture that they've come through, where, where they are assessed and assessed and assessed. And they see it as the, the way of understanding um, how they are doing. You know, and so a conversation with the tutor, which was the way that I understood how I was doing. Um, it is no, it, it, maybe we get back to that idea of unlearning or de-schooling at some point at the beginning of an arts education and not trying to make some kind of exceptionalist claims for our education should be different to, to everything else. Maybe all higher education should work in simple ways. But then I don't know, you know, I'm checking myself as I say that because, you know, one of the things I was thinking about as I was preparing the questions was, um, you know, it... it in a way, some of what Harry uh, uh, said in one of the videos was an idea that um, uh, uh, the, the kind of desire to study art should almost be enough. And I think you've reiterated that, you know, if someone wants to come to art school and they have the kind of desire to be there, then maybe that's enough to let them 
in, in, into the art school. But of course, we I hope we wouldn't think of our um, trainee surgeons in a similar way. You know, there's a moment where in certain professions where specialism and skill, which are the kind of things which, I mean, I, I'm kind of concerned where these are almost uh, high modernist hangovers of, of ideas of de-skilling and, and anti-specialism and all these kind of things, which are, which I think are as um, tired as the idea of talent in itself, you know. Um, where was I going with this? I can't remember. But the idea of somehow uh, uh, that perhaps it, it's about the way that the students understand what assessment is and that actually in assessment, we know that assessment isn't talking about talent, right? The, the way that, in my experience, the assessment um, criteria are written allow students who aren't particularly talented to get very high grades because they can tick the appropriate boxes. And actually some students who I would argue were incredibly talented get much lower grades, but that's because they haven't done certain aspects of the academic work or maybe not done enough work, for example. So the, the idea, I think that's interesting to think about uh, uh, assessment in relation to talent. Yeah, I think I, think I just wanna add, uh, like looking at the, uh, well, working a lot with CPD students, so it's a more kind of older, <laughs> Grown ups, and for them, quite often, uh, uh, you know, assessment and getting grades, it's almost like approval that you know the change of their uh, career and pathway and the choice of you know doing art is is proving to be the right one. And I think the real danger in that is that you know while they're in education, there's this kind of a uh, uh, scale where they can actually find themselves whether they you know they're really successful or kind of mid successful or not successful at all but once they leave it where's going to be who's going to who's going to grade it how are they going to get this kind of uh, approval of what they're doing so i think within the whole kind of art education it might be uh a dangerous as uh, you know while students are studying, they have that kind of a, at least a system where they understand whether, you know, they're successful or not. But then once they leave, you know, you know, maybe a friend or a critic or, or a curator would give them a bit bad feedback. And that suddenly almost becomes like a, you know, feedback would, that would, that they, they get while they're being assessed. And they would, they might place it on a similar kind of a scale and level as it was in their education. So maybe the idea that there shouldn't be assessment within the whole art education is actually quite, quite a good one, because it might be a danger for their future development because they would feel the need to get that kind of a uh, almost grading. I don't know. Yeah, I think I, I think just to back that up, um, uh, Misha, I've I've often had students come back to me after they've graduated and they say how much they miss the group crit. Mm. That's the thing about the art school that they really really miss when they've gone. Not one student has ever come back to me and say that they miss assessment after they've graduated. You know, they're not hankering for more of more of that necessarily. But we do have a question. We have a question from uh, Masha, who Misha, says it was a very captivating. Yep. Uh, there's a question from Masha in the Q and A, but if you if you look in the chat, there's quite a few questions going into the. Oh, okay. Well, should we do Masha's first, and then I'll come back to the to the chat? Okay. Um, so apologies for missing the, the the questions in the chat, but I'll I'll come back to them. Um, so it's from Masha who says it was a very captivating uh, to listen to the symposium. Um, she says, being a fine arts student, I always differentiate two ways of working: copying and appropriating, basing on someone else's art and the work from myself. Uh, from my own thinking process feelings and experience uh, and it has a completely different response for the viewers and a different level of involvement for me the personal works more fulfilled and firm has a potential for the development do you think it's about talent curiosity or sensitivity don't know who wants to to come in on that one all oh. Uh, I, oh, no, you go, Annie. I haven't. I mean, I can only grasp a tiny bit of that 
question, but the bit that struck me that I was interested in was just this thing of thinking about these different discussions as to what the copying is and what the imitation is or the appropriation or whatever, and that you're experiencing different things maybe with either between your own conception and your tutor's conceptions, or maybe it's different tutors. And perhaps just to me, what's interesting there is again, this, um, uh, I suppose, figuring out where, where these ideas come from in terms of these um, recognitions of what the value of copying or the value of of imitation. But I'm sorry, I haven't actually gone to the last bit of your question. So, um, Harry, maybe. Um... Yeah, I, I like this idea of, you know, uh, differentiating between curiosity, talent and sensitivity. Um, and, you know, not necessarily that you can easily put those things into a hierarchy. But um, I think curiosity is something that, you know, going maybe back to early in the conversation where we think about things maybe we identify in, you know, uh, applicants or even in students you're working with is something that I think you you could, you, or you, you do regularly witness that is students, and, and not even just students, I think it applies to artists and, and, and whatnot, um, but cur like curiosity is something that is massively beneficial to people. Just being interested in and curious and questioning um, in and of itself is a is a is an, a really important virtue, uh, and one yeah I, I, maybe I personally would feel is something that I, I I I would see as more important than than yeah a talent in a, in maybe a skills based way of thinking about it, um, but then that I think also adding in sensitivity, um, you know again whether these things are, are trained, whether they're something that's developed, whether they're something that's innate, um, you know, the be, being able to be sensitive to things uh, is, is an amazing virtue. Yeah, so in, in a sense, I, I, I like the question and, and personally, yeah, I, I think maybe talent is the least important when compared to curiosity and sensitivity. I think we learn to be sensitive more all the time we learn harry in a way mm -hmm. i think if we learn if our, the learning we're doing is productive we're learning to become more, more sensitive, sensitive in one way or another i would i would argue i'll, I'll go to it to another question it's from uh, geraldine snell um and she said uh, the conversation's got a thinking about james alkin's quote from uh, his book why art cannot be taught uh, art can can be taught but it seems as if it can't be since so few students become outstanding artists and the idea of mediocrity. So it says, how does talent relate to mediocrity? Next question. Hey, John's not happy. Can I answer the previous one about aptitude and sensitivity? So yeah, go on, John. <laughs> you know, or does anyone want to come back about that idea of how? <laughs> talent relates to mediocrity there was a movement wasn't there in the i think uh maybe started in holland in the 1960s which was the mediocritists <laughs> there's a kind of idea of democratizing uh, uh what something it to strive for yeah. i don't know i mean i think there's something in me mediocrity that could be sort of uh perversely strange in relation to the kind of i don't know a certain system of a star system of art making and the, the personality of the artist and, and that kind of thing. So I, I sort of think there's uh, maybe something in it. Yeah, sort of another sort of slant on that. And it goes back to John and Annie talking a little bit about how you might sort of reclaim the word talent and what might what that might mean. I have a I have a sort of real problem in an art school when we talk about professionalism actually because I. I'm, I'm a sort of a bit of a champion of the amateur and I think amateurs become a sort of a bad word. But but if you went back to sport at one point, you know, sort of amateur sport was the Olympics. If you were, you know, if you if you were a professional, you couldn't be in the Olympics. It was it was a it was it was it was fine to, you know, I, I, Charles Darwin was an amateur scientist. Um, you know, the, the, he wasn't paid to do that. So, so at one point, the, the whole idea of the amateur was great and, and being professional just meant you just got paid for it. Where now, professional is something to aspire to that it appears as though if you're professional, you do something well. And if you're amateur, you don't do something well. And I, I, I'm not sure I sort of I buy into that. And I, I quite like to sort of uh, 
as, as well as maybe John and Annie talking about how you reclaim the, ta uh, the, the idea of talent, I'd quite like to reclaim the idea of the amateur. I feel that's so. You'd have to reclaim that also from, um, I'm sorry, I forget this, oh, where, where I saw this now. Um, so it's T.S. Eliot writing um, something about um, the amateur and the professional and his, his desire to be, you know, for, the, for a professionalism was a way of getting away from the idea of the amateur that was very much embedded within a certain kind of class, you know, that, you know, you were able to claim that position precisely because of your elevated status. Um, so um, Elliot, and I wish, I really wish I could, because I remember we talked about this many, many years ago, Sean, and I, and I stumbled across this essay by T.S. Eliot, and since then I've never been able to find it. So maybe it doesn't exist. Um, so, but anyway, um, so I think, I think we end up having to repurpose it or reclaim or redefine these terms all the time. Um, and in, in that sense, I wonder whether, you know, what, what we have to do, what we really must do, and I, and I say it like that because I think ultimately we, we won't be able to, uh, is to dispense with all of these terms, yeah, that we, we're not going to have a term like sensitivity or a term like um, uh, engagement or whatever, and, and that each each moment of bringing, and I'm, I'm, I want to avoid using the word judgment, but each moment of thinking about like, you know, what is it that a, a person is achieving at any given point is a conversation. Like, what is it that you think you are achieving? So in a sense, the whole responsibility of how we reflect on our achievement shifts from the place of the, the assessor to the place of the person who is engaged in that, in that very process, you know, to say, well, you know, and we could stage that any number of times and any, you know, and of course this is really costly. Yeah? So suddenly mass education will not work in this situation unless we put a lot of money into it to be able to have that level of, um, of the, the kind of evaluation that is ongoing, that's a conversation. And wait, what does it sound like? This sounds like a tutorial. I think there's the, um, uh, uh, Yira has a question that maybe kind of follows up on some of those ideas that asks, um, uh, are assessment, uh, assessments and feedback moving more towards open questions rather than judgments? I, I would I would want to get away from the whole structure of it, really. But uh, I, I think uh, I think the the person sorry I didn't catch the name the person is right, you know that that's what we are moving towards to think about these open questions in a way. Um, having and having said that, you know it feels like it's another it's another system, isn't it? It's another kind of mechanism um that we're we're having to deploy in some way to do that um because and having done the training on open questions i still have no idea what it is well i, I think there's something to be said for uh, i mean this is thinking more from a, a tutor perspective um but in the ideal scenario you are um, helping the student reach the point in which they no longer need you, no longer need your validation, no longer need your opinion or, the, or your questions, that, that they, they've developed to a point in which they are able to take agency and take control o over that process. And, you know, I think, um, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the idea of, of us needing to provide some sort of judgment or, or, or going well done or you know in a sense that should be be um, thrown away as, as quickly as possible uh, and, and just that there, there's more capacity to to have space for for conversations to allow students to really sort of analyze yeah their own learning and and their own achievements um and and to um you know and also question all these things i think that's that's also a big part of it right is the way in which you know, like w w the conversation so far this this evening, right, is is about breaking things apart and, and really questioning and, and rethinking it. 
Um, and, and again, that's something that you have to gain experience in um, and, and have forums in which to do that. And a big part of, I think, the educational process is, is, is hoping to provide that for people to, to, you know, yeah, to experience ultimately. Annie, I saw a hand flick up. Yeah, there, just please, please. quickly, and I'm just going to throw it out there as, as, as a different angle. But I mean, we're talking a lot about what happens within an art course. And um, <clears throat> one of my interests is like how sort of certain pedagogies and ways we approach teaching sort of travel through time and how they emerge in certain or they grow in certain moments in time and kind of linger and persist. And one thing that's I struggle with is just with the size of universities and, and courses in the UK anyway um, and then the world outside this very free you know uh, free as in um, each to their own um, personal res responsibility for your own kind of like where you get in life with a dissolved state and stuff like that yeah. that the kind of what is sometimes celebrated perhaps as a sort of not celebrated as a wooliness but the the openness of fine art education in what ways does the openness of fine art education with all its procedures and methods and stuff confront this very kind of open freewheeling world outside in, in which the students go into and that's really dominated by the market and um stuff like that but that's actually just a bit of a provocation i don't you know we should go back to the questions i think yeah okay i i, I agree we should a very good provocation though uh, and one that I kind of yeah got me itching to, to respond but I agree let's go back to the to the questions uh, Cecilia asks uh, does anyone on the panel have uh, experiences or interests in how alt forms of art education mitigate some of these issues alternative art schools yeah I think well or, or alternative forms of art education I mean I think sometimes I, I, I uh, they happen within art schools don't they you know if we think about um, very famously at the at Central St Martins, or was it St Martins at the time? The locked room, for example, would be a great example of that happening within an art school. It's alternative education within an art school, John, isn't it? But but then also maybe less famous examples. Can you say something about that? Uh, <laughs> no, no, well, no, you no, can do in response. No, but no, I think no, other examples time. like interactive arts at Manchester, which ran yeah. for about twenty five years, and uh, you know was a course where when it first started, the staff didn't do any assessment. The students assessed each other. Uh, and the the, the institution came and said, oh, you can't do that. And now actually more recently at, at, at Manchester Metropolitan University, they are looking at increasingly looking at forms of student led assessments. Well, that's really interesting, Magnus, because when Alternative Arts started or, or a couple of years after it started uh, was when I started teaching at Foundation at Leeds and I ran two years of collaborative projects that happened out of Leeds City Art Gallery. And I, I, I was... Um, I knew Dave Smith, who was, who, who was running Interactive Arts, and Dave gave me his marketing system because we were talking, because we, we, we had 10 students working together on a collaborative project, and arguably they knew more of who'd put an input into that project than the staff who were marking them. So we, we made 10, sorry, we made, there were, 13, there were three members of staff, we made 13 mark sheets. Um, so it, each... Each student marked each other, so marked every student, and they marked themselves, and and then the the three staff marked the ten students, and then we had a we had a graph that had the students' own <coughs> own grade, the aggregated student grade for them, and the aggregated staff grade, and on ten bits of criteria the aggregated staff grade and the aggregated student grade on every single, on all 10 students, on all 10 bits of criteria did not deviate by more than one mark on all those students. But the, but the student's individual grade for themselves was either way below what the other ones were or way above it. But the, but the student, so, you know, in terms of the students marking each other, they, they were so close to what the staff marked. It was incredible. Mm. Mm -hmm. Anyone I else want to talk about the idea of the the, the alternative arts? Yeah, I, I think I would. Um, I would. I just want to say just something very quickly about that, which is that if it were not so populated by <coughs> art students, um, 
I would think that there's something alternative about it. Sorry, Celia. Do you mean there's too many students? Um, I've yet to see one of these alternative art schools um, that aren't. Oh, um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So they recruit from the art schools. MAs and stuff, yeah, yeah. Um, and, or, or people who already have degrees. Um, mm. and I, I, Islington Mill Art School in Manchester is really different to that. I, I think that there, there, yes, I have heard that there are one or two examples. And I think that that should be the model, yeah, where it really dispenses with um, uh, the, the, the system that already pre exists it. You know that it enshrines within it in, in some way um so they become and and i'm you know this is not a comment on on their value in a sense i think they, they're clearly um really interesting and in some ways maybe you know where they you know where they sit is much more as an alternative to postgraduate education uh than undergraduate education currently but i i, I have noticed that a few and maybe even um the the east school whatever it's called um uh has started to do something different certainly that's not how it started out i felt that it was just mirroring um a, the pre-existing model by recruiting from recent graduates um but that seems to have shifted and the, the mode of what they do is is quite different i think i you know i can't i can't say um anything very precisely about it but um I, I agree that there are other models out there or there are places or, or uh, uh, educational forms that are, are quite different that we perhaps don't talk about enough rather than but the ones that we... I, I also think that in relation to this, and this is something that Sean and I have discussed quite a few times over the, over the years, but that part of the problem in relation to this is that when you go to uh, the UCAS website, when you go on British Art School uh, 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 websites when you go to the design your future uh, sorry create your future it's called now fair and you go and look at the information from different art schools it kind of sounds exactly the same and yet the reality is what you get on different degrees in the UK certainly those that I've taught on is really really different mm. and so students aren't making an informed choice within the the let alone with about alternative art schools but they're not making an informed enough choice within the art schools that are there to make a real decision about the kind of education that they want because there are huge differences uh between but, but don't you think magnus that, that that information really comes from somewhere else i think it's not something that's enshrined in the ucas um, information that you know then the student going to um open days etc cetera, etc cetera, is where they get their information sure but they can't all go to open days no, no i agree yeah. with you i agree no, with you but, you know, but, but i think that you know i think that um you know this is partly to do with how um the the language of education and maybe the language of pedagogy has so permeated all art schools that we end up just mirroring that language and that's my problem with 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 that you know, I think that that's. Um, I also think it's a it's a, a, a bureaucratic codifying of yeah a, a, of education, which is about a particular ways that you can express a learning outcome or assessment criteria without getting sued. Maybe you know <laughs> how you can express the aims of a course, and a student can't come back and say, "Well, you didn't do that, yeah. so I'm going to sue you." You know, that these are uh, maybe I'm being overly cynical. There's a there's another quite there's a question oh, actually I just for me. To, linked to the, go on, Harry. Yeah, sorry. I just um, um I, I well, uh, a year or so ago, I was doing a residency that was linked with Venture Arts in Manchester, which is literally just down the road from Manchester School of Art. Yeah. Um, and is an organization that works predominantly with people with a, a range of uh, learning disabilities, essentially. Um, and runs a five day a week, you know, full, full time um, studio in which you have workshops, um, whether it's drawing, painting, printmaking, uh, they have ceramics, photography, all sorts of stuff. Right. And, and the people that go there have a have a really actually if you compare it to, you know, even a foundation course actually have an incredibly intensive, though lasting years and years and years uh training or, or, or educational process in which you're you know continually working and refining and um uh, very actively making as well uh but 
interestingly, a lot of the, uh, or out of the conversations I had with various people there, um, you know, there's a real sense of they, they perceive themselves or, or, are, or are perceived as outsider artists. Um, you know, they've not gone through higher education in terms of this. So a lot of their members, you know, some actually operate quite successfully as artists, but are still deemed or they see themselves as, as outsider artists. And I just, I don't know, I, f I found this sort of odd uh, observation, really, that in the art school up the road, which is this sort of HE thing, a lot of the students who maybe before they got there had this idea of what art school is, where you sit in a studio all day and, and paint and do ceramics and, and refine the craft and get taught all these things, uh, isn't what happened, right? It's a much more open and expanded and discursive education they go through. Um, but but it, in a way, it's like the, the yeah, I, on either side, they almost wanted the opposite thing, uh, but they, you know, you could just swap them over and in fact, it, it might be, a, in a way, I think there's a great uh, project or, or, or something to do with that. Um, but, but, you know, what is, what, what is an alternative education? And in a sense, um, I, do, I do think there are alternative art schools or alternative education out there, which maybe shouldn't be seen as such. Um, but uh, it's, yeah, I mean, this is a bit of a diversion. I'm very happy to go back to the questions, but it's, I think that's just something to, to bring up in relation to this. Yeah, there uh, are any more questions? So I, I don't, sorry, Harry, I thought you'd finished. Do you want to finish? No, I was just going to say, if you, if you want to go somewhere and see talent, go into somewhere like Venture Arts is, is full of absolutely amazingly, t what, what you might more traditionally think of as talented artists, you know, really incredible um uh, work being made, you know, because of this different model that maybe is is the model that a lot of, uh, say, A level or, or uh, you know, B tech students think they are or expect to get from uh, a HE art education. I think this idea of swapping the art school with venture venture arts for a period of time is quite interesting. I think there's a new project for you there, Harry. Yeah, hopefully. Um, maybe if, if someone can give me some funding, that'd be nice. But might take a few quid that one. That one. Harry. Yeah. I know. <laughs> um, so there's a, there's a question for me. It's from uh, Sarah. asks uh, She says that I mentioned earlier that St Helens is a non-selective course that produces talented uh, students. Yeah, I was trying to I was trying to use the word talented maybe slightly provocatively within the context of the conversation. What do you think is core to this? Is it good teaching? Maybe focus needs to shift onto how we teach rather than the predisposed talent of an ideal student, which maybe a lot of selective institutes rely, might rely on too heavily. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly I, I think the idea of an ideal student is problematic in, in, in many, many ways, because again, I think it has an, uh, the, the, the potential to exclude um, without going too much into that. And I do think the teaching is exceptional at St. Helens. I also think that, uh, you know, one of the big factors there is the, uh, is the staff student ratio. And so the students get an awful lot more contact time with the staff, certainly in the beginning of, of the course. And then that's kind of tailed off as it goes on. But um, they, they may have around 10 students a year and they have four staff. Now, not all of those staff are full time. But so we're talking 30 students, four staff. And, and my experiences are more like 25 students to one member of staff or at Manchester, 34 students to one member of staff. And so I, I remember the... Um, when Manchester was expanding um, and, you know, questioning that and being told by one of the senior managers there that, that we were all very, very good educators and we should be able to educate anyone coming in at any level, you know, if we were taking more students and, and that was falling. But the reason I think that St. Helens can bring these students on who perhaps don't have uh, uh, um, necessarily the... Uh, um, uh, uh, the the pre-learning if you like that a lot of students who get into more selective art schools have so they don't have you know perhaps these students parents weren't taking them to galleries and museums and art shows and whatever all the time or they didn't go to uh, uh, a, a particularly great school but the staff there can pay them a, a pay some attention to them you know, and I think they can really bring them on and help them develop their thing, their own thinking, you know, their own practice through that. I think it also helps them there 
um, and I'm not saying this is necessarily a, a, a good thing, but they, it is a degree in painting. And so they're focusing on a particular discipline. And so the skill that they develop is within that, you know, and the ability they develop is within that. They're not thinking more broadly, perhaps, about uh, what art could be. Although, you know, by third year, there are kind of expanded painting practices uh, uh, and all sorts of things happening there. So I think there's a lot of reasons, and none of which I've kind of done any deeper research or scientific uh, testing into so they're kind of I suppose they're they're kind of just propositions based on my experiences uh, external examiner rather than rigorously um, uh, researched answers to your question um, Stuart asks and this this is this is a, I think a bit of a, a provocation from Stuart he says in the Scorsese part of uh, the three-part film New York trilogy the studio assistant asks the cliched artist painter to look at her paintings asking, am I any good or am I just wasting my time? Is there an educator's responsibility to step in occasionally and say, cut your losses, you've no aptitude, brackets talent for this? Is, <laughs> is there a moment when we should be saying, yeah, you're not gonna, you're not gonna do anything with this? I've done that. Um, but in the in the context of there has there, there's been students who have just really really struggled in many ways and there's points sometimes halfway through a course where it's worth just talking about the rest of the course and really do they want to carry on with the course and is it worth it for them especially now with all the money and fees and stuff like that. But, so, is that more about commitment then on their part, Annie? Really? Um, Combination, you know, you get to know people over a period of time, don't you? And you kind of start, you know, start to wonder for all sorts of reasons why they're doing the course and whether it's the best thing for them. So it's, I think, yeah, combination of different stuff. But it's different to the image that's portrayed there of being in the studio and like yeah. saying you're talentless. So. It's not but I don't think way. it's actually always about the commitment. I think sometimes it's actually, you know, it's not right. And it's just not 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 happening, and uh, you know you just get a feeling that they probably should should try something else because it's not happening for some reason. Whether you know the the institution that they've chosen is is not right for them, or whether you know they they really trying to perceive something else that's not actually what they've chosen initially. Mm -hmm. There's maybe a responsibility to, uh, to the, you know, it's, it's not possible to do it fully, but I think there's a responsibility to at least uh, try and make students uh, a bit more aware of, of, of what they are getting themselves into. Uh, so at least they're able to, to make a, a bit more of an informed choice, not necessarily to as to whether or not to continue, but more about how they might navigate the the art world that they're entering into, or, or the wider world they're in, entering into. Um, so I think there's, yeah, to it, it would be unfair, I think, just to discourage someone, which is maybe what that uh, film scene maybe maybe raises up because they're equally people develop at all sorts of rates and in fact sometimes the people you may not think as as being hugely talented or hugely successful or even who really struggle during that particular stage of, of their educational development um you know c c later can go on to to clearly prove people wrong and do amazing things um but i, I think there's a responsibility you know, which is not always easy, just to at least make people or make students uh, more conscious of and, and therefore more prepared for the, the, the possibilities or, or the different avenues they might have to engage with or have to navigate. Um, which is definitely easier said than done because it changes so rapidly, especially given the last couple of years. So the, the flip side, I think, of, of the, that question we've just had would be one from uh, Geraldine, who uh, says, we all know there's a correlation between attendance, engagement and assessment slash attainment. What about students who are disengaged and not apparently talented, 
or even antagonistic slash resistant, but go on to become very successful artists? I don't know how you I don't know how you answer that one. I think there's always people who I'm trying to think of an example. But also, it's this idea of a, of a successful artist, and I think that's going yes. back to the, the quote earlier that I think was about, oh, uh, is art education any good because it doesn't produce that many great artists? And I think that's the thing that we also have to really challenge and question. And, and you know, ultimately, and I think Annie alluded to this at multiple points, you know, this is often a market-influenced or market-driven um, structure that that benefits certain people often or almost exclusively in unfairly or at least in an unbalanced way. Um, so you know, I, it, it's also about what is a great artist, and actually, I think even the purpose of art education just being a, a you know a finishing school for, to become a, a you know a successful commercial art world art fair artist isn't well that that seems like a a failing of the idea of art education you know i think it's more interesting that you're just putting out more open-minded more critically engaged and more maybe sort of uh culturally productive uh, individuals into the world um at least from my perspective i feel i've got much less interested in in just sending people into the art world. I, I, it almost feels like send, it's more important to send artists into the rest of the world. I always wonder why this question is posed to art and not to mathematics or to philosophy or to literature or whatever. Uh, like I wonder how many English students go on to become writers or how many mathematicians go on to become you know mathematicians well it's certainly at a world-class level yes you know so that kind of sense in which you know um, we're expected to produce uh, a certain percentage of artists um, out of the art school in a way i think this sort of goes a little bit back to um, a, a, a question that was posed by um a, now fa famous educationalist John Thompson um, around like you know what is art education for is it is art education for the making of artists or or is it is it that we're using art through which to deliver education um, and this dichotomy always seemed to me ridiculous at the time it sounded like when he when I remember when he said it and I thought oh something we need to reflect on, but very quickly it seemed to me a kind of ridiculous kind of dichotomy because what the hell does that mean? Um, you know, people go through uh, an education um, in an art school and do all kinds of different things afterwards. And why the hell should that not be the case? Mm -hmm. um, so it's for me like a non-question. But I, well, I, I could kind of get into the the increased and problematic employability agenda. That's in, for sure. In much of world education in in, yeah. in 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 relation to that, but also, I think the the problematics of putting art in service of other things, you know, and suggesting yeah. that, you know, when we go through an arts education and you know art might be kind of then artists working with scientists or artists, you know, art is good at doing things with science or sociology or whatever it would be. And I'm not, I'm not saying there isn't a place for that, but when we, I think it's Gert Biester who, who argues that when we reduce art to that, we put it in a problematic situation because if politically a decision has to be made, then it turns out that art isn't as good at sociology as the sociologists and it's not as good at science at the, at the scientists. But so I think then it's, make it's an argument about what art, art education is for. It, but it's asking, it's asking it to be the same as, which is different to saying that there's a contribution that an artist might make. Uh, to a conversation that happens between an artist and a, and a scientist, for instance, um, and you know, and or, or between an, an artist and um, um, I don't know, a sociologist, or you know, I think, I think there are different ways in which we can think about that. But I don't know whether it's particularly useful to think that uh, an, an art school has to produce a certain number or a certain percent of people who go on to become practicing artists um, and and that is the definition of what the education is um, 
uh, you know, nobody, nobody in the philosophy department tries to ask that question the same way. Well, you know, we have to teach philosophy to make sure that it's going to service, as you're putting it, Magnus, or rightly, I think, to question it in that way, to service any number of possible career options. Um, you know, nobody in the philosophy department would think that, yeah, because they already accept that there is a, you know, there is a, um, a, a way in which philosophy can be put to use in, in different ways, yeah? a, a mode of thinking, or whatever all those underlying questions that we think about when we're thinking, well, what is an education for? Or in what way do we measure education? Sorry, we come back to that question, which I don't really don't want to uh, return to um, right now. Um, but it's, it's different to thinking that it's then servicing different industries in a way. Yes. yes. Um, because I think that question has to do with the problem that education in its entirety is now straddled with. And I think we, we, you know, we end up asking this question specifically to the art school in a way that I think is a question that's about the whole of the education system. You know, so, you know, when we, when we, you know, and I think that's a problem, really, that the art school thinks it's its own particular problems that are somehow disconnected from all the problems that the entire higher education system is straddled with. Mm. And so maybe then that, that suggests to me that maybe within art schools, there should be more conversation about this, perhaps, or maybe some more influence of philosophy or something like that. I just wanted to say that I think the reason that that the art school, that this pressure, whatever is on the art school rather than philosophy or mathematics is because art is the ultimate commodity. <laughs> it yeah, is. I'll, I'll, I'll finish with another prov provocation then Annie, which is in, in relation to these ideas that I once um, witnessed a conversation between two uh, very uh, senior figures from two art schools, which will remain nameless, who were arguing um, that, that a uh, you could judge a good art British art school by how many Turner Prize winners it. Oh had. my God! Yeah, and that's an extreme end of it, right? But I think we are really, really running out of time. So I'd like to thank all the panelists uh, for for their amazing contributions. And my head is spinning with different questions, more 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 than anything else, and different ideas. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who's who's come to be with us tonight. An amazing attendance, um, and and some great questions from the audience and. Uh, Harry for putting the show on and provoking all of us to think in these ways uh, and Sean for convening the panel um, and do, do you have a last word to say Sean or should, should I say good night? Uh, I just want to thank the panel as well I'll, I'll just, yeah. so thank you thank you for chairing it very very well Magnus and uh, thank all the panel members and, and, and the audience for their great questions so yeah Thank you Sean Thank you Thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thank. I I feel very spoiled that this has <laughs> uh, happened as a result of, of this show. So thank you all very much. <laughs>